suppose the first question that I ought to begin with is, is why Bhagat Singh? Well, quite simply, because he is the most sustaining symbol of the Indian national freedom movement. Um, so much so that uh, Bhagat Singh was voted uh, the greatest Indian by the India Today magazine uh, ahead of Gandhi and, and Nehru. In fact, he differed fundamentally from, uh, from Gandhi, whereas Gandhi had recourse to mystical doctrines of Hinduism as a prop on which to justify his philosophy of non-violence, non-cooperation at all costs. Uh, with Bhagat Singh, he had a far, far broader base. True it is that he does use Indian visionaries like Guru Gobind Singh, who also, of course, raised the sword in the quest for justice and only in the quest of justice and only as a matter of self-defense, and also the Maharati Shivaji. He also, however, well, in addition to that, drew from Western thinkers like no one else, Lafayette, Garibaldi, and George Washington. And so he, uh, and, and on that basis, he regarded uh, Gandhian nonviolence as utopian nonviolence. So he differed markedly uh, with, with, with Gandhi. Um, and indeed, when he died, only at the age of 23, uh, essentially just a young lad, he was more popular uh, than Gandhi in 1931. If you speak to people of that generation, they will tell you he was more popular than, than, than Gandhi. Now, I, of course, had heard of um, growing up of the two Shaheeds from my grandfather in the old days when there was no television, no telephone, in fact, no electricity even. Time was sp spent by gathering around after dinner and telling stories. And my grandfather would speak of the two Shaheeds, Shaheed Udham Singh, who avenged the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, and Shaheed Bhagat Singh, who avenged the killing of the nationalist Lala Lajpat Rai. Um, and, and the story had always been at the, at the back of my mind, but the, the immediate impetus actually that made me uh, look into this more deeply was actually a writing that I stumbled upon. Um, and this is, oh golly, um, let's go to the slideshow. That's great, thank you. Right, okay, ah, that's much better. So here we were uh, starting off. Um, which led to the writing of my book. Now, what really induced me to go down this road was this, having heard these stories. And, and there was always this mystique as to exactly how he was murdered, how he was killed, judicially murdered. And, and the story had always been sidelined and there he was existing on the shadows of the Indian independence movement, quite not you know, uh, brought alive. And, and, and for me, what changed it all was this article in the Hindu uh, newspaper, the leading highly respected Hindu newspaper by a no less highly respected academic, Professor Chamanlal of the JNU. And he adverted to the existence of these rare documents, 135 he said, that lay across the border in the uh, Lahore archives, the civil secretary's office in the tomb of an Arkali, which he said were not even accessible to Pakistani scholars. And that they told the story of exactly what led to his death and how he was effectively um, put out of the reckoning for uh, uh, recognition as far as the Indian independence movement was concerned. I, well, I can tell you now, having been out there, that there are not 135 documents, but actually 160 catalogued documents in the Lahore archives. Much else remains that is not catalogued, but 160 I've been able to look at and I've set them out in, in the book. He also referred to how it was that Kuldeep Nayar, who had been a journalist, a very uh, well-known journalist in India, and rose to become the Indian High Commissioner here in London. And in 1980, he had gone to the World Punjabi Conference across the border from where he had originally come at the time of partition. And, and there he was struck by the fact, as he said, that not an arch, not a statute, uh, not a plaque was dedicated to Bhagat Singh. And, and he tried very hard to have access to, uh, to these documents, but he was simply uh, rebuffed on the basis that this will complicate the quote unquote sick question. Now, what that may be, well, I can tell you now, there is no sick question at all, remotely implicated, because he wasn't fighting as a Sikh, he was fighting for Indian independence for, for everyone. But in any event, 
uh, Kuldeep Nair failed and failed right to the very end, even when he was in London. And of course, there's an excellent book by Kama McLean written in 2015, which also refers to the possible existence of documents in the Lahore High Court. Well, again, I can tell you there are, there's nothing there. Everything that exists is in the Civil Secretary's office. So off I thought I would go and rather like uh, Indiana Jones, but without the fedora hat and the uh, rugged looks, I thought I should set out on my little adventure, pack my bags, book myself into the Lahore Gym Khana, and the mornings would take the rickshaw because there weren't any taxis over to the uh, uh, Civil Secretary's office to look at these documents. But before then, there was, of course, the little matter of a visa. So along I went to uh, Lounder Square, where the Pakistani High Commission is. It wasn't the first time I'd been there. And I went in and I was taken upstairs to see the Deputy High Commissioner. And uh, he said to me, uh, Sardarji, which Gurdwaras do you wish to go and see? this time. And I said, no, 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 not, not Gurdwaras. I've, I've, I've been to see Gurdwaras and what an unbelievable experience it was too, which will live with me forever. No, no, this time I want to go and try and see if I can have access to the Bhagat Singh documents. And a mortified look came on his face and he said, Sardarji, but Bhagat Singh is our hero. Hai. Bhagat Singh is our hero. Now, I, the reason I, I, I say that as it is, is because I would return to this idea. Initially, I thought, when confronted with that, that maybe he was taking the mickey, being rather flippant, maybe even facetious, but he wasn't. And with a spring in his step and some alacrity, he paced across the large room to the other side on the desk, picked up the phone and said, I've got this gentleman here, issue him with the maximum visa that we can. And I got the maximum visa. So clearly a flying start and off I went. Um, and... Um, there it is, the uh, Anarkali tomb. There you are. Uh, much better, much better. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so there's there's the Anarkali tomb um, itself in the civil secretary's office. William Dalrymple writes that it is so heavily fortified that to even get to its gates is very, very difficult. So how I managed it, heaven alone knows. Um, and then uh, I began my research. Now, before I, I go any further, I think I ought to say something about Bhagat Singh and his, and his family. Um, his great-grandfather is Fateh Singh, who had fought with Maharaj Anujit Singh in the Anglo-Sikh Wars as a result of that, lost all his lands. And he was given the option of uh, relenting, but he steadfastly refused to do so, and so remained landless. His son was Arjun Singh, who lived in Jalandhar, and in the scramble that Marina Wheeler had previously spoken of uh, on a previous occasion of the great agricultural colonization scheme in West Punjab that was taking place, centered in the, on the river Punjab with its diversion of the waters into the canal system that led essentially to um, the fertilization of 6 million acres of arid dry wasteland, turning it into the most fertile land in the whole of Asia. Tribes, clans, peoples from everywhere poured in on the promise of 25 acres of land. And Arjun Singh was one of them. Quickly, he fell under the spell of Swami uh, Dayanand Saraswati, the Arya Samajas. Not difficult to see why, because the Arya Samajas, like the Sikhs, believe in that against the caste system, against idolatry, against priestcraft, against child marriage, against idol worship, all those things. But on top of that, he was the first person to lay the call towards Swaraj, self-rule. And that's what attracted Arjun Singh. He is, in fact, by all accounts, the first Sikh to join the Arya Samaj movement. In fact, when um, Bhagat Singh goes to school in Lahore, it was customary for Sikh boys to go to the um, Khalsa High School in Lahore. The grandfather said, no, you will not go there because their governors are sympathetic to the British. The hymns that they sing, in the mornings are sympathetic to the British. You will go to the DAV school, the Dayanand Vedic school, um, which is quite the opposite. Uh, so this is how Arjun Singh goes there. And um, he settles outside Lalpur, a village called Banga, builds a Gurdwara, digs two wells, which are still in existence there, and has also uh, a Sarai, a guest house. But unbeknown to many people also allows dissidents and seditionists to come around who are given sanctuary, his wife Jayakol, 
uh, also a system. She's a specialist in bo bone setting, and in fact became the first woman in the Punjab to join the Panchayat, i.e. The, the village council. That's how distinguished she was. Um, and um, thereafter, he has three sons, and the three sons are Kishan Singh, um, Ajit Singh, the uncle, and Soren Singh. Now, we know from James Carr, who was an intelligence officer who wrote uh, a book, Trouble, uh, Political Trouble in the Punjab, that all three of them went to prison. Uh, in 1910, his father, Bhagat Singh's father, uh, Kishan Singh, is sentenced to two years imprisonment because he's a purveyor of seditious material. The younger brother, Swaran Singh, uh, he arranges a protest when a Muslim lad is shot by an English officer, you know, bringing Muslims and Hindus together down the road in Lahore. And he's sent to Lahore Central Jail, worked uh, like an ox, and um, within a year and a half, he dies with TB. And in many ways, he's the forerunner of Bhagat Singh because he also dies at the age of 23. And Ajit Singh, I'll come to in a moment, he's the most interesting. And in fact, there's a book to be written on Ajit Singh alone. But here are um, four photographs uh, on Bhagat Singh. They are, I must tell you, the only genuine photos of him. He starts off as a Sikh. At the age of 10, he moves with his family from Banga to Lahore, 240 kilometers trek, and enters the DAV college. At the age of 14, he goes to the National College, set up by Lala Lajpat Rai, leaves at 17, because his grandmother is insistent that he gets married, and he would not get married. And the reason for that is because he's got two uncles. He's got Ajit Singh, who uh, goes to jail and is sent into exile with a doting, loving wife left behind, Arnam Kaur. And she does not see her husband for 50 years. There is then Hukum Kaur, who is the daughter of, sorry, the, the wife of uh, Swaran Singh. She, when she dies, she's the only sister of seven brothers. She says, what has God given me? Why should I believe in God? I have a womb that is barren, that was childless. And I have had a husband who has never been here to look after me. Very sad story. And Bhagat Singh actually wrote, he wrote 50 letters. There are only two letters which he wrote in Punjabi. And both of them are addressed to um, Hukum Kaur, his younger uh, aunt. First one written in age 14, Dear Chachi Ji, I've been painting the photograph or the painting of um, Chacha Ji. I'm sorry I've not been able to finish it to bring it along, but I'll try and do so as soon as I can. A second letter written a bit later on, Dear Chachi Ji, I am so sorry I've not been able to come and visit you. Those are the two letters that are in Punjabi, and it's significant that they are in Punjabi and all the others are not because of his closeness to that family plight that um, and heard that they're going through. And he wasn't going to get married and put his um, his wife through through that. Um, and indeed, um, uh, only at the age of, so he, he runs away at the age of 17 uh, to Kanpur. At the age of 20, he's arrested on entirely false uh, charges for his involvement uh, in the uh, Dussera bomb blast. Um, he's jailed for, for five weeks. Uh, and if you look at his writings, uh, he's really completely at loss. You know, why on earth have I been... Uh, arrested, I'm, you know, they've taken my clothes, they've taken my books, they won't return them. My letters have been intercepted. He writes to the uh, governor general about that saying, you know, uh, will you put matters right and so on. He's bailed out after five weeks for 50,000 rupees. Dollar Tram puts up the money. It's by all accounts, the largest bail amount ever up to that point in India, just for a lad of 20. And then of course, um, the photograph that we most know him with, which is uh, the 21 year old um, when he um, uh, escapes after the murder of uh, uh, Saunders. Uh, the two points really I want to make in relation to what I've just said is this. Firstly, Bhagat Singh has early knowledge of martyrdom. He differs from uh, all the others, from these urban politicians like Gandhi and Nehru because he comes from uh, the indigenous movement, which believes in martyrdom. For him, there is no nobler way to fight for Indian independence than to be prepared to die for it. All right, at a time when very few, if any of the leading politicians are prepared to do that, becoming a Shaheed and to give Shahadat as he did, gave the martyrs with a hero at precisely the moment that he, that he needed it. And he's unique in that. Um, and that's the first thing. And, and, and after all, he had plenty to 
learn from. He's only eight years of, of age when Kartar Singh Saraba is hanged and in Lahore Central Jail as a Gadarite. Poor Kartar Singh is the only son of his family. He returns from Berkeley University, age 19, and betrayed in India and is hanged. Bhagat Singh carries his photograph on his person in exactly the same way as Udham Singh carried Bhagat Singh's photo on his person. He's only 10 years of age when the Jallianwala Bagh massacre takes place. And there is a story that he tiptoed out of the house in the evening, went to the Bagh and collected the blood-soaked red sand in a jar, in a glass jar. And that glass jar is available to see to this day in the museum at Khatkar Kalyan, just outside Jalanda. The story can't possibly be true because the place was heavily fortified and guarded, but it's a good story. It links him with Jalianwala Bagh. And of course, he's only 14 when the Nankana Saib massacres take place, when the Mahants, the custodians of uh, the Gurdwara uh, shoot down, hack to death and burn with kerosene scores of men, women and children. And so he has, at a very young age, absolute knowledge and experience of martyrdom. The ultimate sacrifice is to be prepared to, le to lay your life down for freedom. That's the first point. The second point is this. Bhagat Singh, in addition to that, is the ultimate rationalist. I've already referred to the fact that he draws very, very broadly from events around him. So when, for example, in 1926, at the age of 19, he sets up the Najwan Bharat Sabha, the Young India Society. He draws directly from Giuseppe Mazzini in 1831, setting up the Young Youth Movement. That's a direct copy. And within that organization, his plan is to bring under one egos, under a socialist banner and a non-religious banner, all of the Punjab's youth. Two years later, in 1928, at Ferocia Kotla, amongst the medieval ruins uh, at the Kutub um, in um, just outside Delhi, he gathers with Chandra Shekhar Azad, all the youth uh, who had splintered away um, from Bihar, from Uttar Pradesh, from Rajasthan and Punjab, under the HRA, the Hindustan Republic Association. And the following year, he adds the word socialist to that. Hindustan Socialist Republic Organization is formed. So those two events are really important to uh, bear in mind. I, may, I make the point in writing here that, you know, he'd left college um, age 17 because he didn't want to get married. And, and he's hanged in 1931. He had just seven years in which to show what he was capable of. And it's utterly remarkable that he managed to do what he did. And I'm, I'm left always with the feeling, what would have happened if this emerging class of young self-educated men had been allowed to take the rightful place after India's freedom and not really being vanquished as they've done. And I think it's a real sorrowful tale. The entire history of India would have been completely different, but I must press on um, and go on to Ajit Singh. Ajit Singh, as I've said, there is a book to be written on him alone. Two things I want to say about him is this, that he is the person who, during the canal colonization process, um, the British levied heavy fines on people. The water rates, in fact, James Carr in his book refers to the fact that the water rates were so punitive that Englishmen were beaten up by the colonizers there in Rawalpindi and in Lahore because they were suffering so much. On top of that, a ill-timed piece of legislation is meant to be passed. In 1906, the Punjab Colonization of Land Act is going to be passed, which is going to you know, add salt to their wounds. And uh, Lala Lajpat Rai writes to Kishan Singh, uh, so Ajit Singh, and says, look, we better get up there to Lalpur and make a speech, but do be conciliatory, please. Do make sure that you begin by first thanking the British. He says, no way. No way am I going to start with that. I'm going to let them have it. He gets up and there is this call, this absolutely immortal call now, Bagari Sambal Jatta, protect the honor of thy turban, O farmer, or O Jat. It is a call that has resonated throughout the ages to this day, to the farmers today in Punjab, because what's happened last month, 23rd of February, has been declared the Pagri Sambal Jatta Day, all because of Kishan Singh, all because of Kishan Singh. 
And he makes that speech. And what happens is, of course, riots break out as a result of that. Uh, he is arrested. He is jailed for two years. He is sent to, into exile. He ends up. He, he ends up in Paris and then in Lausanne and even in Senegal in Dhaka. He puts himself over as um, uh, a, a teacher of Oriental lang languages. His name is uh, Mirza, someone or other, a Muslim name, teaching Persian and so on. Uh, he then comes to Latin America in Brazil. From there, he is in direct contact with the Gadda movement in San Francisco. Eventually, he races back to Europe. And there he has a meeting with Sebastian the Bos, and then he disappears again. He only returns after 50 years, the longest period of exile of any leader. You see, the Punjabis have a lot to tell the world about. Look at the first I've just given you just now. After 50 years, he returns on the invitation of Jawaharlal Nal Nehru in March. He retires in a place called Dalhousie um, in Himachal Pradesh. And three months later, having heard uh, Nehru's tryst with destiny speech, he dies with the words on his lips, my mission is accomplished. Before he dies, he begs forgiveness of his wife. He touches her feet. He said, I'm sorry that in your old age and ill health, I wasn't around to look after you and I have failed you. And for this, you must forgive me. Uh, that's the first thing I tell you uh, 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 about him. The second thing is this, that 1907, actually is the year that sets the stage for what is to follow in Punjab. It is a watershed moment. What follows in the decades thereafter, the emergence of a clear conflict between the Punjabis and the British government is traceable to 1907. The entire rise of the Gadda party is due to what happens in 1907. And we feel the tremors of that right the way through to Jallianwala Bagh and beyond until independence. There are only two acts for which Bhagat Singh is known and for which he has suffered the penalty. It's remarkable that when he's born, his uh, grandmother calls him Bhagawala, the blessed one. And in the Indian edition of the book, I've said, look, he was Bhagawala, but only for India and not for himself because he, the, the death that he died was so, so, so unfortunate. And the two uh, cases for which he's known is this. Uh, on um, the um, 30th of October, 1928, you've got the Simon Commission uh, arriving uh, in India. This is a seven member commission of all white male British parliamentarians, one of whom is Clement Attlee to be the future prime minister of uh, England to discuss um, constitutional reform and India's future to which the Indians say, well, look, come off it. This is a denial of our right to self-determination. If, if, if this is for us, there must be some representation of an Indian here. So what Lala Lajpat Rai does is he meets uh, the commission of seven at Lahore uh, railway station with a throng of 5,000 protesters, all chanting and all protesting against the commission with the chant, Hindustani hum hai, Hindustan hamara, marja jake, Simon, you can make what you will off that, but effectively that is saying, go take a running jump, mate. Well, that did not endear itself too well, did it to the presiding uh, police superintendent who was uh, a man by the name of James Scott. There's a lati charge. People are beaten mercilessly in what is essentially a peaceful protest. And James Scott sees through the corner of his eye, Lala Lajpatrai, uh, uh, the, the uh, book earlier that I was um, uh, referring to, um, in fact, um, by um, uh, called the Martyr uh, that has been written, uh, that refers to this. Um, and and, and uh, uh, poor Lala Lajpat Rai, an old man, is struck mercilessly on the head and is reduced to the ground, um, bleeding away, and he dies uh, 17 days later. That death leads to the unleashing of a whole new wave of violence across Punjab. It transforms the political landscape of Punjab. And Bhagat Singh, who is uh, now, as I said, uh, the leader of the um, um, uh, Hindustan Socialist Republic Association, decides that they must avenge his death. And so uh, three or four of them, in fact, four of them, uh, do a dry run. And they say, look, we're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
as a matter of honor, uh, take revenge. And uh, then on the 17th of uh, November, they go over to a Narcoli police station. But coming out of the front gate is not James Scott. James Scott on that day, unbeknown to them, has gone to Kasur for the day, the place where uh, Baba Bule Shah comes from. Um, and in, in his stead, there is a young probationary assistant superintendent, the same age as Bhagat Singh, age 21. The poor fellow is pushing a motorcycle and he comes to the gate and head constable Chanandas runs after him and says, Saib Saib, you've forgotten your keys, gives him the keys, clutches, puts them in his pocket, the gate opens, and as he speeds off, crack, gunfire, and Saunders is felled. That's Chandra Shekhar, who fires the first shot. Bhagat Singh moves in, fires seven shots into his body, dead. I've seen very detailed photographs of uh, uh, the killing, uh, the, the, you know, the post-mortem with the precisely places where the gunshot wounds went, and then they disappear through DAV College, which is directly opposite, and into safe houses, not to be found. And they issue a notice. There's that notice seen, I believe, for the first time, issued by the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army signed off by Balraj. Balraj is one of the many names that Bhagat Singh goes by. It's an alias. And it says, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai is avenged. It is hereby notified that there was a retaliatory action of none but a decisive nature. All right. So this is what it was, a, a, a um, uh, avenging of um, of that, uh, th that death. Now, let me just, uh, uh, time is short, uh, but I have uh, so much to, to tell you. Um, um, in case you're, um, you're actually um, uh, wondering, um, you know, I came across a decision, a, a 2002 decision called Singh versus MIMA by an Australian judge. This involves a, a Sikh guy from the Punjab who had fled in 2002 to Australia seeking political asylum on the basis that he'd shot a policeman and therefore now at risk. And what Justice Gleason says is this. He says a retributive action is not the antithesis of political action. He says there can rarely be a serious political struggle in which the taking of revenge is part and parcel of political action. And he says we in the West have actually been blessed with a very favorable climate where we don't have to think about revenge. But in every other situation where you've got an oppressive regime and killings are taking place, and in that case, I mean, he Singh was the member of the Khalistan commando force. And you can imagine with that membership, what would have um, uh, been uh, his um, his lot, uh, family members of his had been killed, so he took, took revenge. So I think it's very important that we recognize exactly how this is put. In that notice, they say, we have taken retaliatory action. And that's important because um, uh, the um, um, uh, Shiv Varma tells us, who was with him, that he, Bhagat Singh spent a couple of days thereafter, deeply immersed in in thought and sorrow, you know, regretting the, 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 the death. And there's another statement that um, is then issued by the HSRA, which says, uh, sorry for the death of the man, but in this man died the rep representative of an institution, which is cruel, lowly and base, so much so that it must be abolished. So there's a clear political agenda here that they are following. Um, all right, so that's the first uh, event. Now, Bhagat Singh got to clean away with this, completely away with this. He would never have been hanged had he stayed away. Because what happens is this, they've escaped. And when they've escaped at night, he arranges his escape from Lahore. Durga, Bevi, Durga Babi is the only revolutionary woman at the time. Again, as I say, someone ought to write someone on her. And she is brave enough, despite being married, to agree to come to his house and to accompany him outside all the way to the whole uh, railway station and to flee as husband and wife. He cuts his hair, the turban is removed and he becomes this anglicized Anglo-Indian person uh, with somebody, in fact, it's Rajguru who carries their, 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 their luggage and they walk over to the railway station and they get away. They get away all the way to Hara, a thousand miles away in Calcutta. All right. And he needn't have come back. And when I, when I look at the telegrams that are, which some of which I produced in the book between the Viceroy of India and London, they haven't a clue 
who the killers were. And they, you know, they interview people, 18 people are put before a identification squad and there's nothing that all of them are let go and so on. But for the fact that Bhagat Singh, being Bhagat Singh, returns four months later to take part in the second act for which he is known. This is the bombing of the Central Legislative Assembly, the present parliament uh, in, in, in Delhi. I use the word bombing quite wrongly. In fact, it wasn't a bombing. What he did was, together with BK Dutt, throw two smoke bombs into the chamber and then to surrender and to declare inkalab Zindabad, long live the revolution, and then to say, arrest me, because I want to have my day in court in, in which I want to explain why I've done this. Now, as I said before, Bhagat Singh is the ultimate rationalist. In doing this, he has just taken a leaf out of Auguste Volant, who in 1893, in France, before the Chamber of Deputies, threw two low intensity bombs in revenge for the killing of his friend, Ravachol. And Volant was also an anarchist like Bhagat Singh was. And then he said, I now want to make my statement what I wanted to do was to make the deaf hear a direct copy by Bhagat Singh, 1893, 1929. He's so widely read, he knows what to do. And so it is, he goes before um, the uh, 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 magistrate's court. And um, uh, in fact, uh, there's, there's a book, one of his very distant relatives, the thing about Bhagat uh, Singh is that um, uh, his relatives, um, one of whom is, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, no, the relative of um, um, the Indian judge. Indian judge is a known intellectual by the name of Irfan Habib. And he has written a book quite simply called To Make the Deaf Hear. Right, that's a book worth looking at. Um, and, and so then what happens is that they're of course taken into, into custody and um, in custody, he starts demanding uh, access to newspapers and books because he says, I'm not a common criminal. I am a political prisoner. As a political prisoner, I should have access to books. Now he, I don't have time to go through all of this, but um, in jail, he, his period of education really begins from the 8th of April because he starts reading avidly. He reads so much. He's obviously read Marx, Engels, and Trotsky, but he also reads Victor Hugo. He reads uh, Dostoevsky. He reads Spinoza. He reads uh, Thomas Paine. He reads uh, 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 J.S. Mill. Uh, he reads Tagore. He reads Thomas Jefferson. He reads them all. He reads 300 books. In fact, so fast is he reading that the Dwarka Das Library cannot keep up with sending him the books. Even on the day when he was hanged, he's reading the revolutionary Lenin and that's saying to him, come on, come on, we've got to get you to the gallows. Um, and there it is. Uh, now, there's a little story. I really don't have time, but there's a little story about that signature. Somebody uh, tweeted and said, look, how sad it is that um, um, such an educated, refined person who wrote so well was hanged. Well, whoever wrote that isn't the only person. Whilst I was um, at the Lahore archives and I developed a very good rapport with them, um, the director, we were chatting and so on. He said, so Raji, look at that signature. He said, he said you know, I, I was wrong to say to you that you were the first person, first Sikh to come here. There were a couple of others and they were husband and wife and they were here to look after for the Gurdwaras and so on. But they stumbled into the secretary's office and they said, look, um, director Saab, we just want to see something, you know, something to do with Bhagat Singh. And he said, what? They said, look, anything at all. And he showed them that document. The hand went down it. It rested on the name Bhagat Singh and they wept. They wept profusely, tears down their eyes. And he said, I couldn't stop them from crying. I said to them, are you all right? But they wouldn't stop crying. Such is the affection that Bhagat Singh still has amongst people who, who know. As I say, I must really uh, soldier on at a gallop. Um, right, he makes two speeches. Uh, again, this is not terribly clear in the literature that often comes out of India. In the first speech on the 6th of June, 1929, he says, look, he says, revolution is not um, an individual vendetta, nor is it the cult of the pistol or the bomb. 
And this is something else that one needs to understand about revolution. For him, revolution is not a single event. It's not a violent event. Revolution is a continuous process of renewal, of rejuvenation, of a permanent finding of a new way of life. That's what revolution means. I mean, I'm reminded a bit about jihad, you know, there's the, uh, amongst Muslims, the internal jihad that you fight of refining yourself and coming to terms with uh, a, a new world that you want to want to live in. And that's what he says. And, and he, in that statement, he says that revolution is a means by which manifest injustice must change. So really, rather like Guru Gobind Singh, from whom he takes, you know, um, inspiration, it's manifest injustice that he's fighting against. Nevertheless, he is uh, sentenced to transportation for life, uh, together with BK Dutt, and he appeals. He appeals to the High Court, and in the High Court he says, look, the sentence is unjust, quite simply because you haven't looked at my motives. My motives were not to kill. No one was physically injured, no one was economically injured. We surrendered, we could have run away, but we surrendered, and therefore we shouldn't be given such a harsh sentence. Justice Ford, in the High Court, rules that Bhagat Singh is a quote unquote sincere revolutionary, unquote. By that stage, however, unfortunately, what's happened is that they've caught on to the fact that it was he who was involved with Saunders' murder. So rather than transport him, they now have to start a second trial, this time for murder. He's taken back into jail. And in jail, he discovers that the jail conditions are appalling. They're categorized as prisoner A, B, C. If you're European, you get into category A. If you have a mode of living that is westernized, and speak a bit of English and so on, you get category B. And all the other dregs, they get into category C. And the food is terrible and the conditions are awful. And so he goes on a hunger strike. The longest hunger strike up to that time was by the Irish hunger strikers, which went on to 97 days. Um, poor Jatin Das went on a hunger strike and died after 67 days. A first class student graduate from Calcutta, a terrible death. He is commemorated well in Calcutta. Bhagat Singh goes on a hunger strike for 116 days. His weight of 133 pounds plummets by 15 pounds. And that's the condition in which these boys are brought in before the magistrate. And often they can't do that. And because they can't do that, they don't appear, which is why the government now decides, you see the story gets better and better, doesn't it? They decide to pass the hunger strike bill. The hunger strike bill is going to ensure that anyone who is on hunger strike can be excluded from his murder trial. The evidence can be called and then he can simply be sentenced to death. And the bill is going through Parliament, and in attendance is, uh, of course, uh, Motilal Nehru, Nehru's father, Sadar Soba Singh, Krishwan Singh's father, Wallabai Patel, and the notorious Sir John Simon, together with Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah rises to his feet. He is the highest paid lawyer in India, always, always immaculately dressed, as in that photograph. He is a person who is a staunch defender of civil liberties. He had defended not only Annie Besant, he had defended Vallabhai Patel, Sarath Chandra Bose. He had defended also the Sikh leaders in the build-up to the Gurdwara Act 1925. And he rises to his feet. And with a passion, he says, and I've quoted it, long speech, the man who goes on a hunger strike has a soul. And because he believes in the justice of his cause, he cannot be excluded from his trial. And people are awestruck. People of the Congress party are awestruck. And some egg him to carry on and not to stop because he's been speaking for two days. And the bill falls flat. Entirely due to uh, Jinnah's speech, that bill fails to succeed. I wondered, I've, uh, there's a uh, friend of mine, uh, Ishtiak Ahmed, who's written a book called Jinnah. And I was asking him, can you tell me why it is that if he spoke so well, then why he didn't defend Bhagat Singh? And Ishtiak didn't know either, and I certainly don't know. It uh, a bit more work to be done, it seems to me, on that. But had he defended Bhagat Singh, uh, things might well have been different. Now, the British government is not to be outdone, is it? Because if it cannot get these people um, by way of a legislative act to exclude them from their own trial, it's going to do it administratively. So what happens is this, the trial runs. It runs before a regular magistrate from whom there is a right of appeal to the High Court. The magistrate is Raisab 
Siri Pandit Siri Krishan. He hears the appeal for 10 months. That's almost a year. He calls 230 witnesses. But during that time, some witnesses can attend, some can't because they're on hunger strike. And what now happens is this. Suddenly, that trial stops. It stops because the uh, Viceroy, Lord Irvin, in his summer's retreat in Shimla on the 1st of May, invokes uh, a statutory provision and moves the entire trial from a regular court from where there would have been a right of appeal from a death sentence to the High Court to a tribunal. What basis does this tribunal have? No constitutional basis at all. What he does is this. What he does is this. He invokes Section 72 of the Government of India Act. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand this, so I'm going to explain it very easily and you'll, you'll understand it all, I'm pretty sure. Section 72 says this, it says this, in cases of emergency, quote unquote, in cases of emergency, the government may pass an ordinance for reasons of peace and good governance, provided that it is only for six months. Right, what is that provision intended for? For heaven's sake, I've looked at it. To my mind, it is intended for, if you've got a law and order situation, maybe a Jalewala Bag or the 1919 rebellion, which it was running for many, many, many months and so on, then you can take extraneous measures to deal with an extenuating situation only for six months. You may declare a, a curfew, provided there is an emergency which you can identify as an emergency and only to maintain peace and good governance. And after that, you've got to bring normalcy and raise the curfew. Or possibly there's a famine and food has to be distributed and people are running amok and all the rest of it. And again, for uh, you know extenuating uh, reasons, you uh, declare a curfew or you say that people are to be confined in a particular way. There is no way that that provision allows you to create a judicial tribunal in which you've got to wrap everything up in six months there are, for heaven's sake, 600 witnesses to call. 230 have been heard. 400 odd are to be heard. How on earth are you going to do them all in that time? And where, 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 where is the emergency? Where is the peace and good governance? Here are a group of people who are in detention. They are not uh, 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 absconding. They are not at large. They are facing a trial before a regular judge on specific charges where the government has to prove a prima facie case, a basic case against them. If that is proven, then they have a right to a jury trial. And if the jury then convicts, they have a right to an appeal to the high court. All of that goes. There is no right of appeal from the tribunal. The tribunal is staffed by three judges. The judges can be changed at any time for any reason whatsoever. and. Uh, uh, the rules of evidence would apply. The Indian Evidence Act does not apply. And, and, and the whole thing is just uh, made up out of thin air. Um, and the Lahore Bar instantly objects. The Delhi Bar does not. And I've set out the very clever way. I mean, when you look at the way these Indian lawyers at the time were dealing with this, very, very clever indeed, very insightful indeed. For some reason, the Delhi Bar doesn't. One of the things that's said about the Bugsy case is that it didn't have the nation's leading lawyers representing these poor boys, um, which had been the case in other revolutionary cases and so on. Um, and, and so uh, what happens is, is this, that lo and behold, exactly that which you thought would happen happens. Within a week, the tribunal goes into difficulty because the tribunal starts on the 5th of, uh, of June. On the 12th of June, Justice Coldstream asks, directs that the young men be beaten up in court because they'd sung a revolutionary song. Now, it was customary. It was well known that the, in all revolutionary cases, people would come in and before the public galleries filled, they would sing a revolutionary song. They would say, in clubs in the bad, long live the revolution. They'd settle down. The judges would then start. And that was customary. In his case, he took exception to that and he had them beaten up and so on. And the next day, you know, there's a call for an adjournment. The hearings can't go on. There's an Indian judge who, again, has not been heard of at all. There's a wonderful film that you should see. It's a film by uh, Manoj Kumar. Um, and guess what? It's called Shaheed. It's the first film made by him in 1965. And in that film, he 
um, it describes uh, exactly uh, what happens. Unfortunately, accurate as that film is in many other ways, it's still available on 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 uh, on YouTube. The grainy crackly sound there. He doesn't show Justice Aga Haider. Justice Aga Haider is the only Indian judge, and when he's asked to put his name to the order that Justice Kotri makes, he's distancing himself, and he says, "I will not do so." And already he's showing partisanship to. Uh, uh, to the boys. The, at night, the prosecutor goes to his house, knocks on the door and asks to see him, completely out of order for prosecuting counsel behind the backs of everyone to go and speak to a judge. And he says to him, look, you really ought to desist, you know. And Agahide says to him, I'm a judge, not a butcher. Now, I, uh, I traced um, his great niece in a little town, uh, an hour's drive from um, Lahore, called Gujranwala, a place where, from where Maharaj Ajit Singh comes from, Hari Singh Nalua comes from, and Amrita Pritham comes from. from. And she's a very proud lady, having served, um, in fact, um, in the upper legislative uh, assembly herself, living in blissful retirement. And she told me, she said, to this day, when people try to push me around in the upper legislative chamber, I would tell them, watch your step, mate, because I belong to that family that refused to sign the death warrant for Bhagat Singh. You see, there are these stories. I mean, there I was thinking that the High Commissioner was taking the Mickey when he said, Bhagat Singh the Sadda Hirwa. But there are people there that believe that, that, that still remember Bhagat Singh in the way that you would never would have thought it. And so poor Aga Haider loses his knighthood and he retires and is forgotten. Half of his family is on the Indian side and half of it is on the Pakistan side. And they're in touch. And as I said, Irfam Habib is actually his uh, distant relative. Um, and uh, the, the, the film actually is a very good film uh, by uh, uh, Manoj Kumar, because what happens is it's the first film to win the um, the National Film Award for the best Hindi feature film. And when it wins, uh, and it's going to be shown for the first time in New Delhi, Indra Gandhi turns up and rumor goes around that she's going to be attending. Uh, the first showing of this, when Manoj Kumar's father finds out, he rushes over to Punjab, collects Bhagat Singh's mother in 1965, brings her down to Delhi, and Vidyavati, the mother, when she walks in, she gets a standing ovation. I mean, absolutely spectacular. And Manoj Kumar testifies how he sat with her. It took him four years to make that film and cried. He cried with her um, about the um, what had happened with his with his son. Um, must get on. So. Um, the two judges had their uh, fates sealed, had they not. Um, Justice Coldstream had to go, quite simply because he had ordered the beating uh, in his court uh, of uh, these uh, uh, prisoners. And Aga Haider could not stay because he had sided with them. Now I came across this order by uh, Chief Justice Shadi Lal, which gives the reasons for reasons of health. Well. <laughs> both of them having to be removed on the same day, both for reasons of health. Well, come on. And they're then replaced by uh, two other judges. Now, here is something that, again, tells you how completely wrong this was. Uh, you know, others, historians, other far better place than myself, have talked about coercive colonialism, how colonialism was actually an exercise in coercion of the people that they colonized. Looking at that more and more, I ended up saying that in my case, this would be coercive colonial legalism. Because here you've got the entire charade, the apparatus of the law being brought into play to give the impression that the rule of law is being followed, but it isn't. It's the complete opposite. Because look at what's happened here. On a death penalty case where people are going to be sentenced to death, only one judge has heard all the evidence because two weeks afterwards, a week after they're beaten up and a week later, Shadi Lal says they're to be removed, two of the judges are removed. So only one judge, now joined by two other judges, are going to hear the evidence of the remaining witnesses. And then they're going to be sentenced to death. You know, I mean, it's absolutely mind boggling, is it not? Um, had Shadi Lal stayed, it's likely there would have been a two one majority and then, of course, Bhagat Singh would not have been hanged because that had never happened. The only person who had been hanged thereafter on a two on majority was one by the name of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was quite like Bhagat Singh because he also um, was progressive, liberal, and had a concern for the poor. And he was hanged by uh, Tara Masi, who became a household name after hanging Bhutto. It was his grandfather, 
Kala Masi who hanged Bhagat Singh. Okay, and so there is now nothing left but to have the sentence of death, and there it is, the order of death, and thereafter, what we've got is this. Now, here is where the story for me gets interesting, and I'm glad I've still got a few minutes to talk about this, because nowhere in India is this being mentioned. There have been a few reviews of my book now already, and no one is mentioning this fellow here, not that I would expect them to, because I will explain why this would be beyond the ken of most people's perception. In faraway London, as I've already said, after the death sentence is passed by a tribunal, extrajudicially, which is not a court of law, there cannot be an appeal to the High Court. That's the end of it. And, and you know, they, they, they do not even hear all the 457 witnesses. They simply rush through it. And then um, by that stage, the time has gone up and that's it. They disappear into the ether. The judges don't exist anymore. The tribunal doesn't exist anymore. Kaput. All completely vanishes into the ether. But in faraway London, there's a young barrister, a 44-year-old barrister by the name of Dennis Pritt, who on a cold February morning disembarks from a taxi in Downing Street and rushes upstairs to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council to argue the case for Bhagat Singh and the other two before a five-member court. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is the court for the Commonwealth. So in the days, the times when we had the Commonwealth and cases would flood in from Hong Kong and the Caribbean and, and so on and so forth. Um, but with the Commonwealth now decreasing, only a few countries uh, still uh, take their cases there. So at the time, um, that was the ultimate court of the Commonwealth. And he goes in there and, and what he uh, says is, is this, uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, he uh, he says these boys have not been subject to any judicial procedure at all. Rather, they were tried by a privilegium. So you can see why no one in India is quickly going to pick that up. This is a Roman law concept where the Roman emperor would simply, through his prerogative as an emperor, mark somebody as being guilty of an offense and ascribe the punishment, death. And it had infiltrated into English law and it had been known as an act of attainder. An act of attainder was a device uh, fully established by the mid Middle Ages uh, by which uh, what would happen is that um, the king would simply say, you are guilty of the following and death. All right, and this is what would happen. By the time of the War of the Roses in the 1450s, rival factions were taking out the other side's figureheads by simply using the act of attainder. Um, Henry VIII was the first person to actually use it to get rid of his fifth wife, uh, Catherine Howard. Uh, when he married her, he was 49 and she was 19. Small wonder that upon marriage, he called her as the jewel of womanhood, a woman without a thorn. But within a year, he'd accused her of adultery and wanted her beheaded. He couldn't put her on trial because if he subjected her to a trial, she would turn down and say, I'm giving evidence and it is you who's guilty of infidelity, not I. So what he does is he delegates power to parliament. Parliament passes an act of attainder. She's marked, she's executed. As you know, once you've got a law passed by parliament, it's got to be followed. So disreputable was this exercise so abhorred because it completely violated every precept of the rule of law. I mean, the rule of law is known for giving you due process, a, 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 a methodology by which you can come to court, care, have an allegation against you, uh, prepare it and answer it. What this does is it doesn't do that at all. It, it tells you that you're marked. The rule of law also targets behavior. It doesn't target people. What the act of attainder does, it, it targeted the people. And he says that he says, look, this is an act of attainder. And, and this is what's been done. And, and the judges remarkably agree with him. And, and, and the other thing which he doesn't mention, but which is true, is this so bad was this practice that by the 19th century, it had been abolished. The last person to have been hanged was Edward Fitzgerald in 1798 for having uh, you know, uh, taken part in the uh, Irish insurgency. 
against the British. And, and that was the last time no one had been hanged in this way at all. He says, look at, look at the um, ordinance. It sets down no law that you have violated. It tells you no obligations that you've got to satisfy. All it gives you is a list of 24 people. And then in the statement of four paragraphs, it says at paragraph two that these people have not been able to come to court because they've been on hunger strike. At paragraph four, it says they are guilty of, quote, willful obstruction. Well, going on hunger strike is not willful obstruction. And then it says nothing at all about peace and good governance. And it says nothing about an emergency. And yet they're tried and convicted under this and there's a death sentence. The judges give him a hard time. They take a mickey out of him. They make fun of him. I've set it all out in the book. And eventually Lord Dunedin issues a one page decision, a one page decision in which he says uh, that, uh, well, the governor general gave reasons. He uh, was under no obligation to do so. Um, and even if he had given the reasons, that would have been perfectly all right. No, it wouldn't have been perfectly all right. He was duty bound to give reasons. If he did not give reasons, that is bad for law. So really, he was actually, uh, th these boys were judicially killed. They were killed through simply a charade of, uh, 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 of a legal system that was momentarily created only for them in the second Lahore conspiracy case. Uh, and uh, and then they were hanged and there's no right of appeal to the high court and uh, and that's the end of it now uh, uh, dennis pitt went on to argue other cases unfortunately this was the only case that this, sorry this was the first case that he took on he uh, had been to winchester uh, college a conservative when he was growing up but gradually moved leftwards and he moved so leftwards that the labor party sacked him they removed him from the Labour Party, and he, uh, 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 they did that because he actually favoured the Soviet invasion of Finland at the time. And he then uh, stood as Member of Parliament on two occasions against the official Labour Party candidate in Hammersmith and twice won. He went on to do other cases. He took on the Murath conspiracy case, which had three Englishmen in it, who were also all wrongly uh, uh, indicted, and he got them off. The grateful uh, defendants in that case gave Pritt a silk gown, which to this day lies in his chambers. His chambers is the chambers that I knew as a lad growing up as the only civil liberties chambers in the land. All the other chambers, the fashionable human rights chambers, grew up afterwards, after the Human Rights Act. His chambers, the one that he set up, is Cloister's chambers on the east of Pump Court. And that's the chambers he set up. and. That's where he did all these cases. Um, Miruth conspiracy case. And then in the 1950s, he did Ho Chi Minh, Sun Yat Sen. He even did Jomo Kenyatta for the Mao Mao. And there is, in fact, in um, uh, Nairobi, a, a Dennis Pritt Road to this day. But never, never, despite writing his autobiography of four volumes, never does he once mention the Bhagat Singh case. No one mentions the Bhagat Singh case. If you Google, try and find, look at Lord Dunedin, look at the other judges that were in the case, there is not a trace of Bhagat Singh anywhere. It's almost as if some if people are ashamed everywhere to own up to the fact that this was nothing short of judicial murder. There is nothing, not a trace anywhere. There is one case I came across in Singapore where a Singaporean, um, High Court says, oh, we don't have to give reasons. Um, it's enough that the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the um, uh, president has issued this order and that's good enough. But actually it's such bad law that no one would ever cite it again. Um, so uh, that's Pritt for you. A man who really in my heart um, ranks as high as, as Bhagat Singh in many ways. Um, he eventually retired and became a professor at uh, Ghana University. Um, and uh, so sharp was his mind, they said that he would read, even in the 60s, a document only once and never forget it. Now, I did say to you, uh, these, by the way, are the people who were eventually then hanged. Three of them are hanged, um, Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajkru. Again, you know, um, if, as if that wasn't bad enough, normally people are hanged at dawn. The three of them are hanged uh, in the evening twilight at seven o'clock. Bhagat Singh had asked a Muslim sweeper by the name of Bebe 
to get him some home cooked food on that night. Bebe was not allowed to get back into the prison that evening. Bhagat Singh could not have that meal. And then there was a call that he ought to uh, go to the gallows. And the three of them walked up there and they did kiss the, the noose because one of the questions that um, has always been uh, uh, ripe is to what extent did Bhagat Singh and the other two deliberately set out from the beginning to die? It's certainly true that he, towards the end, says, he says, look, the desire, and I'm quoting, the desire to live is in everyone, and it is in me also. And then he says, but if I die, I will achieve more by dying than I than if I live. With with um, um, uh, Udham Singh, the excellent book by Anita Nand, she talks about how there is an ambivalence. Sometimes he wants to die, other times he doesn't. He rather wishes he could be saved, were it not for the fact that Christian Menem is representing him so badly and so on. With Bhagat Singh, there is no ambiguity. From the beginning, although one can never know, I think if you look at the evidence, from the very beginning, he is committed that he will die and stake his life. And it's this, this particular death that shows how he was the ultimate rationalist using Western writers, having the foresight to see and to know that in the end, his legacy will be of inestimable value to people because of what he will leave behind. And in that sense, uh, when he is hanged, uh, here is the uh, uh, actual uh, um, sentence of death being carried out. I'll leave you to read that. The body remained suspended uh, for an hour and was not taken down until life was ascertained by the officer to be extinct. It was taken down at night then and uh, put in the back of a bullock cart and taken over to the river Ravi, uh, on the banks of which uh, the three were. There were already Granthis and Hindu priests, pundits waiting, recited uh, the prayers, and then they burnt them there and threw the bodies into, into the, the river Ravi. Um, and uh, now I did say to you, did I not, that I was going to come back on a slightly uh, lighter note to uh, the Deputy High Commissioner, who remains a friend and with whom I'm still in touch, who had said, but Bhagat Singh, the Sada hero. Well, it wasn't in jest. And it's not true as um, um, uh, what, what you know was said by, uh, um, I forget his name now, the, the figure that um, um, uh, um, Chamalad referred to that uh, when he went in 1980, um, there was not a plaque, uh, not an arch, and not a statue dedicated to Bhagat Singh. Bhagat Singh lives, he lives as much across the border as he does this, this side. Because look at this, I came across this. Here is a organization founded in 2015 in Lahore called the Progressive Youth Alliance. It's an umbrella organization for Pakistani students. And it campaigns for universal right to free education, restoration of student unions, and the right to employment. And what does it say? Just look at it. Bhagat Tera Mission Adura. Bhagat, your mission remains unaccomplished. Ham sab milkar karenge pura. Together we will make sure that it is accomplished. What a slogan. What a slogan. And that's in 2015 that um, for any cry uh, for justice, for rejuvenation, for a people that we should have been, but we are not. It is the name of Bhagat Singh that rings the loudest. That is not all. There's another organization. Here it is. This one called Progressive um, Students Collective, who incidentally have just in the last 48 hours been in touch with me. Um, and they, and there's a protest taking place just uh, in front of a jab cart, the uh, Lahore Museum. And I know not what they're protesting against, faces that I cannot recognize, and there are banners, but there's a huge banner of Bhagat Singh. To support the collective is to support the struggles of the poor and the marginalized in society. I did say that Zulfikar Ali Bhutto came quite close. You know, he came close because like Bhagat Singh, he had a soft spot for the poor and he was progressive and he was liberal and so on. But he made the cardinal error of actually setting out to appease the right wing by defining in the constitution the Muslim, the definition of a Muslim, and thereby ostracizing the Ahmadi population. And to that extent, he fell into disfavor. Still, I think the most revered politician in Pakistan, but he could have come quite close. And then you must be wondering, well, what about the Indian side? Well, what's been happening in India? Well, the first thing that's been happening is the CAA 
the Citizenship Amendment Act. And whilst you see banners of Hindu, Muslim, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 getting together and so on, there is one about Inkalab Zindabad dedicated to Bhagat Singh. I will end with simply this. I cannot show you because it is for you to look up, so easy it is to look up. We are now witnessing at present the largest labor movement protest in human history, 125,000 protesters, one in 30 of the Indian population are gathered across the Tikri border to protest against the three farm laws. When Bhagat Singh's uncle did that, Ajit Singh, he succeeded. The 1906 Act did not get passed. They were able to defeat the British in not getting this passed. The three farm laws are now actually being challenged to such an extent that the farm leaders are now actually taking on the BJP government in Bihar, standing against it. But what I want to tell you is this, that across the Tikri border, the several kilometers from the, Tik the Delhi Tikri border and the Bahadurgar uh, Haryana border, where a new found solidarity has grown up between the Haryana farmer and the Punjabi farmer, it is the name of Bhagat Singh that is being sung regularly in songs, dances, and musical performances. It is his banner. The latest two people to have been released is Nodip Kaur and Shiv Kumar. What does Shiv Kumar say? He said, in 2015, I read Bhagat Singh's Why I'm an Atheist, and it has remained with me ever since. So Bhagat Singh, did he actually succeed? Was he really a failure or not? I would say, look at the evidence. I think, Amandeep, that takes me exactly to quarter past six, and I must stop there. Thank you very much. Uh was extraordinary. Satvinda, thank you so much for that. I've just been um, just in awe of that question, of that story and the way that you told it. Thank you. It's, it's a face, as I've said to you before, Bhagat Singh is a, an image, an icon that we think we know, but actually we don't always know the story. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your, your scholarship uh, with us and, and of course your passion as well. And also, I omitted to thank my colleague, Shamneet Shergill, who arranged the talk today. So thank you to her. I owe her a great debt. Uh, she has been extremely helpful and she has got me to this stage only, only because of her. Thank you. Super. Look, today we've been talking about Sat Winder's uh, Professor Justice book, The Execution of uh, Bhagat Singh. There's a whole lot more to the story that um, Professor Just goes through uh, in the book. So I encourage you to go and get that. If you look on the... Uh, the chat window you'll see the link to Amberley Publishing who are the, the publishers behind the book and if you use the uh, discount code of UKPHA you'll get a 20% discount so, so jump on there uh, and order that now. Look we've got a few minutes left and we've got lots and lots of questions so let me see if I can turn to them. Now if you want to ask your question live uh, just raise your hand on the Zoom window if you just hit the raise hand uh, button, then I'll see your name and I will um, ask you to verbalize your question. In fact, look, we've got an old friend, Ishwar Anand, um, who's got his hand up. So, Ishwar, I'm going to take you off mute. If you just unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Good evening, gentlemen. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. It was superb and uh, fascinating talk, first of all. And uh, uh, while you were explaining about the life of Bhagat Singh, my heart was just shouting out loud, Bhagat Singh Zindabad. And uh, to be honest, uh, we uh, here in India, we have read very less about Bhagat Singh. If I talk about the, the major Indian history, I've been following Indian history for a long time. And uh, sadly, we haven't seen much about the revolutionary activities and the role that Bhagat Singh played in the past. Uh, the major question that I asked in the Q&A box was that uh, Bhagat Singh, uh, was it a right when he surrendered after throwing the bombs, though those were the harmless bombs when he threw them in uh, state central legislative like, assembly back in April 1929, like, was it right to surrender at that time? Though he was uh, not captured by the British since uh, he killed Saunders. Uh, but was that well, the right when you when when you asked me, was it right? I mean, it, it's not with, with, with respect to question of right or wrong. That's what he wanted to do because he didn't want to kill anyone, to hurt anyone. He wanted to make the deaf hear and to have exactly. the opportunity, have the opportunity to explain what he means by revolution. And as you said, revolution is not the cult of the pistol and the bomb. 
it's, right. it's, a, it's a new way of looking at things. No doubt the words make the deaf hear, especially mentioned in quotations. Yeah. And I've also read that uh, he did that to, uh, to protest against the two of the particular bills. One was the public safety bill and the other was the trade dispute bill. Uh, could you please enlighten me something about that? I, I'm sorry, could you, could you just repeat that again? Uh, I said that uh, in the books we have read that Bhagat Singh did so, uh, so that he could protest against two of the bills in the uh, by using the yeah. trial court as the means, and those two bills were the trade dispute bill and a public safety bill. Could yes, you that's please right. enlighten, enlighten me something about them? Yeah, yeah. Look, there were two bills being passed. One was, as you say, the trade dispute bill, which was designed to outlaw strikes. The other bill was designed to outlaw communism. Right now. I, I've not talked about communism, but this was a fear uh, that the British had everywhere because the October Revolution 1917, uh, this, it's remarkable how quickly the seizure of the Winter Palace led to the toppling of um, uh, the, the, the regime in the first workers' revolution and, and how it, within half a century, a third of humanity fell under communist rule and every intellectual in every third world country was rushing to embrace socialism, as did Dian Pritt. And so there's a real fear that these young men were drawing inspiration from uh, uh, the Soviet Union. I've actually included a document from London where the Communist Party of Great Britain is saying that Comrade Bhagat Singh is being tried and he is going to be hanged and we must do everything possible to save him. These are British Communist Party people talking about Bhagat Singh at that time. And the document is in the book. Ishwar, thank you very much. Um, for your thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Professor Just, can you address the question of his religiosity? So often that comes up with, yes. did, he, did he keep his hair in, in jail? But it's a little bit more than that. Of course, he writes that very famous pamphlet. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, for, for some reason, it matters to people that he was a Sikh before he died. I cannot for the life of me see why it matters. What matters is his message. He was fundamentally non-communal communal and non-casteist. Um, up to his time, revolutionaries had talked about being against colonialism and against capitalism. Bhagat Singh went a stage further. He linked capitalism with casteism. And it, it's his message. And what happens in jail is that you've got the Akhand Kirtaniya Jatha by Sabbhaiv Sindhi Singh is in jail as well, who says to him, look, they've sentenced you to death. They'll kill you now. Why didn't you return back to the fold? And he actually says, he actually says it would be hypocritical for me to do so. I have never believed in God up to now, and I'm not going to start now at this time. To my mind, that shows a, the, the better and nobler parts of the human nature than simply being religious and having religious attire and um, you know, doing all your rituals and the like and so on and so forth. So, you know, and, and that's when he writes why I'm an atheist. I mean, people who say that he had reverted to the fold do not read that document. You need to read that document to see why he, towards the right to the end, remains against this. And, you know, had his philosophy actually uh, worked, we would not be in the situation that we are in India, where politics straight after independence has shifted into a, the wooing of vote banks. So provided you could go to the vote banks and the Hindu vote and the Muslim vote and the like and so on. And so casteism and communalism is now stronger than ever before. Now, Bhagat Singh would not have allowed that. The revolutionists would not have allowed that. And, and the tragedy is that even after independence in 1947, his lawyer, Asaf Ali, in 1949 wrote in a Pune newspaper, he said, I really fear that someone who was a household name only a few years ago is now going to be a footnote in history. And 30 years later, in 1978, G.S. Diol writes, he says, it would be a tragedy if he's simply known as a freedom fighter because he had a philosophy. Let me just say one last thing about this. I compare him to Franz Fanon, and I cannot understand that, again, better people than myself who would deal with this. I can't understand why Franz Fanon, who argued that decolonization is necessarily violent because it means the removal of one ruling class and its substitution by another. So it's necessarily going to be violent. Why he is known in the West, but Bhagat Singh is not. True it is that Fanon wrote far more, but Bhagat Singh also wrote, and there are, there are 130 uh, writings of his, 
uh, 50 letters of his, you know, and, and uh, he was every bit writing 30 years uh, earlier, saying the same things as Franz Fanon was. Bugginson was writing in English, right? I yes. Mean, very yes. Blue. I mean, he Absolutely. was reading. He Absolutely. was reading very com complex, sophisticated text. Absolutely. Yeah. In English. Yeah. Very, very well learned. Indeed. Yeah. 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 He wrote, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he wrote in Hindi, he wrote in Punjabi, but uh, his letters to the court are all, all actually in English and so beautifully constructed and signed off. I mean, it, it makes you weep when you look at them. Okay. Really let's does. move on to another question because we've got lots today. Let's go to Tajinda Sindra. So, Tajinda, if you just unmute yourself. Hi, Mandeep, really, I'm listening to you from the last one and a half hour, more than that. Really enjoying, and uh, you've done nearly hard work. I just mentioned it, we, my elder brother, he wrote a book about hidden truth. And we saw some document from the British Library, which has not been disclosed by the writer. I know there's a lot of pressure by the groups. If this, these document come out, it could be change the history, but still some writer, I know you've done a wonderful job, but it might be you have seen a chance when you went to the British Library, there is some truth fact, which I haven't listened, I've seen from any book. And since I've been listening to you, I couldn't see any information, given any clarity on these things. And these documents are very important. Say example one, I give you example. When they hang in Lahore, the body took from Lahore to Saniwala, Frojpur. That distance is 80 kilometers far away from Lahore. And those days, the truck which we took the body is not going faster than 40, 50 miles mile per hour. When they know that the people have big crowd outside the building, how can they took these three bodies far away rather than not going uh, funeral over there? That's a very important question. If you look at the yeah. logic, let, let me answer, answer that. Yeah, uh, I mean your, your your question earlier. There's much in it because um, I keep forgetting the name that Chamalal referred to um, of the um, other journalist. Uh, he had actually written in his book the Martyr. He said, "Look, he is convinced that there are telegrams between the Viceroy and the Privy Council, where the Viceroy is saying to them, look, uh, have them killed.' Now, something else I haven't touched upon is." To what extent could Gandhi have saved him? And there's, a, there's much on that. Gandhi certainly did not in any way intervene to save him. Look, Gandhi at the time from 1930 to 1932 is involved in three roundtable conferences with the British. He could have insisted at that time that Bhagat Singh must be released. He did so in other cases of people who were also guilty of murder, but not in the case of Bhagat Singh. And, and what is being said is that there must be in the light of that, these telegrams, uh, which need uncovering. Now, the answer to your question is, I don't know how I would be able to access telegrams way back then, uh, you know, on Downing Street or wherever they might be uh, housed, which do confirm that they were told that they must throw this appeal out, come what may. Um, thank you very much, Tajinda. We got a, um, you mentioned, Jagdeep Bogle asks, you mentioned in a recent article in the Tribune that Bhagat Singh did not have any legal representation in Delhi uh, or from Delhi. Um, I'm intrigued to find out if Bhagat Singh was point blank refused legal representation by the balance or did he refuse the representation himself? Yes, an excellent question. Very good question indeed. Um, he uh, refused representation um, very early on. He said, I would represent myself. But what I want is to have a lawyer in attendance who can just assist me. And there's a lot of hoo-ha going on where only when the prosecution counsel agrees is that allowed. But later on, when they realized, I mean, they were smart enough to realize that they were going to be hanged anyway. In the five months that the special tribunal sat, Bhagat Singh and the others disinstructed the lawyers. They said, you will not appear for us. Let them do what they're doing. And at that stage, they weren't. Insofar as there are lawyers, one notable one that I was able to discover, Amolak Ram Kapoor, his daughter uh, lives in Delhi. And uh, she had his diary, which detailed some of the information. And it is her daughter who I was in touch with, Sunaina. And uh, 
he represented Bhagat Singh and he was in, in, in Lahore and then shifted after in, to independence to Pakistan side. His house on Fane Road has been taken over by Khurshid Kasuri, the um, Pakistani uh, foreign minister. And they're on such good terms that, you know, we often talk about bad people, uh, you know, the killings and so on. And we neglect to mention how good some people were. Those that were good were ultra good to each other. And, and what he did was he, he transferred the entire library of Molokram across the border to Delhi. And the family is on, on good terms. Molokram struggles to get paid. And I've produced the bill that he tendered for payment. He struggles, in fact, even to have meetings with, with Bhagat Singh. So it, it, it's actually a very truncated hearing. Uh, and and they, can, they can do all that simply because they can, because no rules of procedure apply. This is in the special tribunal. It's, it's, it's farcical in the sense that you simply have a Sharad lined up. And I mean, I, I say this, I say the Bhagat Singh trial is actually the bl blueprint for modern day terror trials, for the Guantanamo Bay trials, because that's where you begin to see how the government could do whatever it wants and, and hold a trial outside the normal court procedures and convict and sentence to death. A number of people have mentioned that exactly that on the chat, the, the topical kind of, um, uh, reflection of, of it in, in the modern day. Um, Harminder Man asked a question, because uh, talking about a character that you, uh, his uncle, uh, uh, Bhagat Singh uncle, who's who you showed right at the beginning, and he was just curious, have any of Ajit Singh's writings in Brazil ever been uncovered? No, excellent question. No, no. Um, I, I must confess, uh, I'm at loss to, to tell you that. There must be. Um, something there. Uh, yes, there, there have been photographs of Ajit Singh with other revolutionaries in Brazil. Um, and, and I've seen him with, with other, other such people. Um, but there must be a lot more. You're, you're absolutely right. Maybe that's the topic of your next book, um, if you can bear it. Right, I'm gonna ask Robin Percival to come off mute. And Robin, if you can... Yeah, hi, uh, brilliant lecture, by the way. I'm really enthralled. Um, but I, I'm speaking from Ireland, and I want I, I want you to answer a question about the Irish connection, because surely there's no coincidence that Bhagat Singh named his organisation the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association when Connolly, James Connolly, had had set up the Irish Socialist Republican yeah. Association. So what 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 was the link with Ireland? Well, they 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 uh, used Ireland very much as a uh, contemporary uh, example of a struggle against the British. And they were constantly looking at um, the uh, devices, techniques deployed, such as hunger strike by the Irish. And, and, and as I showed you in that uh, particular HSRA poster, you not only have the Hindustan Socialist Republican uh, Association, but you have the army side of it as well, much like the IRA. Um, and so uh, there is that 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 interplay uh, uh, of ideas between between the two. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin. Um, look, the sun's gone down on me here, west of London, and I'm afraid we've hit hit our time today as well, uh, Professor. Just that was the most extraordinary uh, uh, lecture today. Thank you for taking some of the questions that we had. We had lots and lots of questions. We'll carry this over onto social media. In the meantime, for everyone, you've got your link, you've got a link in the chat window and an email that will come out afterwards about how you can get access to the book. And if you complete the survey, you can win one of two copies as well. Professor Just, thank you very much indeed. Thank you indeed. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you everyone. See you all next week.